All right. Thank you, everybody. I will try to uh, keep it fresh this afternoon. Where I know we're all tired. Um, I'm looking at myself and looking at how ridiculously crooked my glasses are with this mask on. Um, <laughs> thanks for not laughing at me. All right. So we are, when I figure out how to work it again, we're talking about liberating seeds from seed banks. Um, I showed this slide already today, but this is, again, this is just the the dramatic reduction in uh, available agrobiodiversity of some, some key crops. Um, so seed banks exist around the around the world. Um, they are uh, this one is in Russia. The, they you don't really need much other than some jars and some shelves to keep your seeds uh, to keep your seeds secure for a long time. If they're refrigerated or frozen, all the better. Um, seeds can last for we don't even know how long, but thousands of years um, in a deep freeze. They can last for dozens of years refrigerated, and many seeds can last that long even uh, just in a in a nice dry spot out of the sun. Um, so there are we're going to talk some all about a bunch of specifics and some of the ethical considerations and um, uh, some of the sort of activist things that we're doing with seeds, but. Um, I, I want to do a little, uh, just a little roundup of some of the major seed banks uh, around the world to give you a sense of what is out there. Um, and uh, you can find these, you can find websites for all of these. Um, this is the website for the um, IPK Gottersleben uh, German seed bank. It's another massive seed bank, not, not quite as big as the U.S. government seed bank, but it's huge. And um, you can uh, you can request seeds from this seed bank, and and uh, they'll often send them to this country. Um, ICARDA is an international consortium. The uh, it's it's the international consortium for agricultural research in the dry areas. I think it stands for, and um, the dry areas refers to arid parts of the world where arid land crops are grown. Um, they are, they also have uh, have seeds available. Um, CIAT, the Centro Internacional de Agricultura Tropical, is a Colombian seed bank, which has the world's biggest collection of beans. And um, beans are obviously super important. Um, and uh, this is, yeah, these those are some really really beautiful lima beans. Um, one of the things I was just talking about. Um, with Maya is that the uh, there's beans called tepary beans that come from the southwest and northern Mexico. They are an entirely different species of bean than common beans, than lima beans, fava beans. Um, it's they were they were domesticated locally there in uh, in the desert, and um, as such, they need very little water to uh, to grow. Some of them have been known to ripen to full maturity on a single irrigation. Basically, you plant them, it rains, and that is enough for the plant to grow to full maturity and produce beans. Uh, one thing that's really cool about tepary beans is that they also can produce, they can also set pods even when there's hot nights, which most beans are not capable of doing. Um, they, they need a cool, cool nights to set pods. And so as the climate is warming, we may get to the point where even our nighttime temperatures never drop significantly in the, in a lot of parts of the world. So beans like tepary beans are going to be super important. And uh, a friend of mine is a graduate student at University of Vermont. She's going down to Puerto Rico right now and doing working on a major research program using utilizing tepary beans to um, to uh, figure out if they can be grown in places more. Uh, that are wetter than the Southwest. And I actually think I have a slide later. Um, I've grown some tepary beans and I really, really love them. They actually do really well in New Jersey, surprisingly. Um, so Seed Savers Exchange is another seed bank. 
um, that's a that's a nonprofit seed bank, and um, it is uh, it, they have both the yearbook, which is where members um, put seeds that they have to offer, and then they have their own they have their own vault and their own seed bank where they preserve a number of seeds that are not normally available uh, except by special request. Um, but that's where I got the Nanticoke squash, which we talked about earlier. There's uh, Chief Ridgeway and and uh, Corey. Uh, I didn't mention earlier, but this is another Nanticoke squash. Um, this one is the uh, is called the uh, Maycock, which comes from the Nanticoke word macaque. Uh, Maycock is an anglicized word for it. And this is similarly diverse, like the winter squash. This is their summer squash. Um, these are these were grown to full maturity, but um, when they're immature, they were traditionally spiral cut and then dried over a dowel and then eaten as a staple food all through the winter. So it's funny, we think of winter squash as being the only squash that's winter food, but summer squash was actually a critically important winter food uh, for Eastern peoples. Um, and uh, this is a cucurbita pepo, the same species as um, what as uh, jack-o'-lantern pumpkins and zucchini and crookneck squash. Um, and uh, most people don't know, but there were actually two domestication events of cucurbita pepo. And I do not know how that worked, but it was domesticated in Mexico. And it was also domesticated in, in the Eastern, Eastern North America, in the Ozarks area uh, from a different wild plant. Somehow they were both domesticated into the same species that can cross with each other. And I'll never quite understand how that worked, but nature's amazing. Um, so this is, uh, this is Arkinoa, which is, uh, means Noah's Ark and is a European um, uh, private gene bank like uh, similar to Seed Savers Exchange. Another really good source for some cool old seeds. Uh, the Echo Community Seed Bank down in Florida has some really amazing tropical tropical seeds, um, like these Job's Tears that have a thin hull, so it's a useful grain. They call it Hatomugi in Japan, um, and it's a perennial, it's a tropical perennial grain that could be really, uh, we could be growing a lot more of it. It's really delicious, but we're not. Um, so that brings us to the, bi the big one, which is the main topic of discussion here today, which is the U.S. gene bank system. Uh, as Benita referred to it as GRIN earlier, the Germplasm Resources Information Network. Um, that is the website, which we'll explore in depth. But um, broadly speaking, it's called the National Plant Germplasm System. And uh, in case you haven't heard that word germplasm before or wondered what it meant, um, germplasm just means any propagative material. So seeds are germplasm, tubers, bulbs, roots, cyan wood, um, tiny pieces of, uh, of like cloned material in a tissue cultured uh, Petri dish, anything that you can take and use to produce an entire new plant um, is germplasm. So the US government, like I said, maintain 600,000 different varieties in all different forms in all of these research stations around the country. Um, you know, each station has different specialties. They have different collections. Geneva, New York has uh, apples and cherries and grapes. Um, they have, they also have those at, uh, at Davis in California, but ones that are, that are better suited out here. Um, Pullman, Washington has the beans, um, beans and chickpeas and fava beans and all those. Corvallis, Oregon has the is the clonal national clonal germplasm repository they call it, and they have um, hops and chestnuts, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, a whole bunch of other cool things there. Um, Ames, Iowa has a lot of the grains. Griffin, Georgia, similar. Uh, Miami and Mayaguez in Puerto Rico have tropical plants, cacao, coffee, things like that. So this is what the GRIN website looks like when you go to the first page. Uh, you can, you can um, click that scroll down bar and look for animal germplasm and microbial germplasm as well, if you're interested, but I have never explored those. Um, we're talking about like, I think like bull semen and 
things like that. Um, and like different kind of microbes for making, you know, cheese and things like that. Uh, but the plant germplasm is the big, is what we're here to talk about today. So when you go to the website, it looks like this, and you, uh, you do a search. You can search for all sorts of things. Um, and when I first went to this website, it was because I was trying to, trying to find seeds that were indigenous to where I grew up in Philadelphia. Um, and that's Lenape, Lenape country. Um, and uh, I had sent some seeds, sent away some seeds for um, somebody in um, somebody in Ohio who had seeds through Seed Savers Exchange, and he didn't have any. Ultimately, like three months later, he sent me my three dollars back. This was back when you could only send cash to get Seed Savers Exchange seeds, and um, but he had a nice little note that said, "Here's something else you might like." Um, he said, get me another bag of seeds, but he said, the USDA probably has this Lenape blue corn that you're looking for. You should check there. And he gave me the website. So that was about 15 years ago. And I found, I found the Sasopsing, the, the blue, um, Lenape corn. And you can see here, they tell, this is one that they actually have a good amount of narrative associated with it. They don't always. But this one says, a blue flower corn originally brought to Indian territory by the family of Sarah Wilson Thompson, a full-blooded Lenape who lived on the Delaware Reserve. Her family migrated from their original homeland along the East Coast in what is now New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, and Northern Delaware. The succession can therefore be associated with the Lenape or Delaware Indian tribe. Um, it was donated in 1985 from Oklahoma by Charlie Dean. You click on his name there, bottom left, and it will, sh it will show the original address uh, of the person they got it from and all of the other accessions that that person donated. Uh, Mr. Dean gave two horns to the, to the people, to the researchers who came to him for this. It actually appears that he mailed, the, he mailed these seeds. Often it says, It'll say a collector name, like what, you know, a scientist or some government employee or university person who actually got the seeds. But in this case, it seems that they were sent. Um, and there, there is, you know, there's some precedent. I've, I've heard of other people who get worried that they're not going to be able to maintain it much longer. They're getting older. They don't have anyone in their family who, who they trust is going to accept the responsibility because it really is a responsibility. You can't just put these in a jar and expect to have them forever. You have to grow them out every few years. You really need to maintain them. So some people have sent seeds to the government as a fail safe to make sure that they, that they um, stick around. And um, by making those seeds available, he also made them available to Lenape people throughout the Lenape diaspora, which is a, which is a sprawling diaspora. Lenape people were some of the first people colonized by Europeans on, the, on this continent. Um, starting in the 1600s uh, with Swedish settlers in, um, in the Philadelphia area, Dutch settlers soon after, and then English and German after that. And um, the, uh, so Lenape people now, there are Lenape reservations in Kansas, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario. Um, and yet there are none in New Jersey or Pennsylvania um, and, uh, the, the folks who stay, who stuck around there, like I said earlier about the Nanticoke, they often were forced underground. They, they hid their identities. And, um, this has led to some friction in some cases between the, between the federally recognized tribes on the reservations and the state recognized tribes that have only been recognized in the last couple decades in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Delaware. Um, and uh, but because these seeds are available, um, you know, some of the folks in my area there in, in New Jersey and in, in Delaware have been growing these that came off of the reservation that are known to have traveled from from there. And it's been a really important way for them to connect back to their ancestry. Um, and in some ways, you know, there's 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 a lot of trauma associated with obviously the division between these communities. 
And, um, and so I think for, for a lot of people, the seeds have been a, a real source of healing. Um, and there was just, I had the real honor of being a participant in a gathering on the sidelines of a organic farming conference in January, uh, the NOFA New Jersey conference. NOFA is the Northeast Organic Farming Association, which has chapters throughout the Northeast. And at our New Jersey conference, there was a, they called it a gathering of five nations and they had uh, leaders from five of the Lenape uh, groups, uh, peoples in, in the area, um, all coming together to talk about food sovereignty and seeds. And um, it was really, it was a really beautiful event. And, uh, and these seeds, actually more specifically, these seeds, the white Lenape corn, the Puwem, um, were a really integral part of the, of the uh, celebration. Um, so as you can see, uh, back to the website, um, all you have to do when you, when you, when you go to the site here is click on the shopping cart, just like you're shopping on Amazon, uh, and they put it in a shopping cart. Um, and when you're done, you can, you, I, I wasn't done. Um, <laughs> uh, but when you're done, you can click, you can click, uh, you know, submit. And then you just have to write a paragraph about what you want this material for. And then, um, and then they, ideally they send you the seeds. Um, but one tip while I'm on the subject, there are, uh, it is a lot easier to get seeds out of there if you use an email address that's .gov, .edu, or .org. If you use a .com email address, they will send you a form letter rejection every time. And uh, they didn't used to do that, but they do that now. Um, so it just says like, these are not for home gardeners, blah, 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 blah. Typically, if you respond back to that email and say, no, I am, I'm doing it for this. I'm, I, I want these specific seeds for this specific reason. I'm doing this breeding project or I'm doing this educational project and I need these seeds. They are not commercially available. This is why I want, why I'm requesting them they'll usually send you the seeds, um, but they do get so many response, so many um, submissions that they've really cracked down. And so if you have access to a .org email address or a .edu or a .gov, um, it's much better and you'll, get, you'll be much more likely to get them right away. Um, I also typed in when I was first exploring it, I typed in the name of the town where I grew up just north of Philly called Jenkintown. And much to my surprise, I found a pear from Jenkintown called the Tyson Pear. And it was, uh, they have the really long narrative from this, of this Tyson here. Um, and it was found in the hedgerow of Jonathan Tyson in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania in 1794. I went to school with Tysons who'd family been in the area that long. And um, yeah, it's, it, it, it fell out of popularity as a commercial app, uh, pear because it's a, it's it's it goes soft pretty quick, but the flavor is outstanding. Um, it's a sugar pear, and it's really really beautiful. Um, all right, so this is uh, this is one of my little filler slide, my favorite tool on, on the farm, the wheel hoe. Um, so this is some uh, some sorghum, and that was another thing when I was uh, first going through the uh, the database. I typed in the name of a town where a good friend of mine is from in South Sudan, expecting to not find anything from there. But much to my surprise, there were nine sorghums that came up when I typed in Malakal, South Sudan, uh, including this beautiful coral sorghum. Um, so that's my friend Simon. And I was able to, he, he's a, a, a refugee um, uh, and is has been, um, in the United States for decades now because of the civil war first between North and South Sudan and now the civil war um, within South Sudan. Um, but he was very excited to see sorghum varieties from, from his town. He was actually laughing at me because I had, you can't, well, I guess you can tell, but a couple of those sorghum heads were in really rough condition. We had a fall army worm infestation that year. And so he was like, this is terrible. What are you, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but I've grown some better sorghum to impress him with since then. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, so now this is this was from 2020. They've changed the language. They're always changing the language on the website. But in 2020, for the first time, it's it actually said, um, I have to stand up to read this. Um, it said, distributions to fulfill requests for repatriation of subsamples of germplasm collections to a country or community of origin, especially following natural or man-made catastrophes are considered a high priority. And um, I don't think that language is there anymore, but the, the again, they keep, they keep changing it. Um, and also, you know, in the seed, in, in the seed world, we're much more apt to use the word rematriation than repatriation to honor that women are primarily the, the seed keepers around the world in most traditional cultures. Um, but yeah, that was, um, I will say that regardless of what is the official policy, um, the people who I interact with in the government system, they seem to recognize that when we're doing this work, they, uh, in some cases, I've requested seeds from from Syria, and they knew that we were working with Syrian refugees. Um, without with without saying anything, they would double the amount of seed that they send me in the packet. They would highlight in blue that the number that just the num the count is four hundred instead of two hundred. And I, I, you know, it was like a secret message between me and the whatever research technician was filling the orders. Like, okay. Um, I mean, the fact is most of the people who work in this system, they want the seeds to get out there. They're not devoting their careers to maintaining these seeds so they'll stay in a deep freeze. They want them out there. They want people using them. They want them to be, go back to the communities where they came from. Um, so it's a really, uh, really interesting, interesting process. Um, so this is some of my sorghum slides again. Oh, I forgot to mention earlier that my favorite way to eat sorghum is to harvest the seeds when they're still green and then steam them and butter and salt and mm, like sweet corn. It's delicious. In India, they call it ponk, P-O-N-K. Um, they do the same thing in South Sudan. Um, they, they'll take the, they'll take it when it's still green and um, they, in India, they'll, they'll plunge it into some hot ashes for about 90 seconds and toss it around to sort of Par cook it, and then they'll take the sorghum head, put wrap it in a um, basically like a a pillowcase, and then hit it with a stick. So that that that's the way to thresh. The only really good way to thresh it at that point. Um, and then once the seeds fall off, they bag them up and sell them for five times what they would sell normal sorghum for because it's it's such a delicacy and. Um, it really is delicious. I, there's a, one market in New Jersey where I can buy frozen punk from India uh, in like like five dollars for like a six ounce serving or something, but it's worth it. It's really really good. Um, again, this is the it's the perennial sorghum we talked about earlier. Um, also, back then, ten years ago, uh, the war in Afghanistan was still raging and. Uh, I typed in Kandahar, Afghanistan, and found that there was a USDA scientist there in the 40s collecting seeds from the market in Kandahar. And so consequently, we have this we have this beautiful uh, eggplant. This is the this is the eggplant when it's ripe from Kandahar. Um, this is a, a, a garden cress from Kandahar. It's the biggest garden cress I've ever seen. Um, really spicy like wasabi. That's Lepidium sativum, if you're looking for the Latin. Uh, and we think this one actually might be an oilseed type because there's some record of oilseed types existing. Um, and it, it, gets, it gets really tall when it blooms and makes way more seed than the average little, little garden cress. Garden cress is also called peppergrass. Um, there's a, a variety out there called wrinkled, crinkled, crumpled cress from, um, from Frank Morton that we really love. That's a great one. Um, this is a okra from Kandahar. You can see it's a real land race. It's not it's not uniform, just like that Nanticoke squash and the Maycock. Um, but this has been a really uh, really popular one. We've we've really enjoyed growing it and eating it. Um, so a land race. 
you were you going to ask what a land race is? There you go. Um, so a land race is a dynamic population of a cultivated plant that has historical origin, distinct identity, and lacks formal crop improvement, as well as often being genetically diverse, locally adapted, and associated with traditional farming systems. Um, so basically a land race is like, it's the, it's the population that existed there a hundred years ago before people started buying seeds from, from, uh, you know, seed companies. Um, these are some land race wheats from Turkey. These are some land race corns from across the Americas. Um, another, uh, another okra. Um, this is, this, this okra is, is from Iraq. And you can see on the left, that's not what the average okra in the supermarket in this country looks like. Um, but I'm involved with this project called the Iraqi Seed Collective, which is mostly Iraqi Americans, a few other people from, from other parts of that region, a couple Iranians, um, and a few other folks. And uh, uh, when they saw this, they gave me the seeds to do a, to do a large grow out so we could uh, share it among the, among the collective. And um, when they saw these seeds, some of these people started crying. They had, ne they had not seen this type of okra growing in this country before. And they thought because they are unable to go back to Iraq that they, that they might never see it again. Um, and uh, it's a really, uh, really beautiful one, really tasty. And those are the seeds that I grew uh, this past year of it on the right. Um, but that same project, so that those seeds came from somebody who had traveled to Iraq. Um, but since I've been involved with that collective over the last few years, um, I've started looking for more seeds out of the government collection through Grin. And so this is a this is an eggplant that was collected in Baghdad in 1948, and um, everybody's really excited to get seeds for that too and to try this one. Apparently, this is a type called I think Mahluba. And they, um, they would cut it open and stuff it. It's a stuffing eggplant. Um, but it's also a land race. These are from the same lot of seeds. The, you know, the color was not necessarily um, super important, or potentially it got crossed up in the last 75 years while the government was maintaining it. Um, but it's also possible that it arrived with, with some level of diversity. Um, this is a, a watermelon from Homs in Syria. Watermelon there is not not always just treated like a dessert, but it's really treated like a vegetable. Um, watermelon is grilled and served with feta and uh, and mint and other things. Um, and so some of them are not sweet, but the flesh is quite firm because it needs to stand up to being grilled. Um, really love this watermelon. Also from uh, from Syria, this is a pepper called Haskorea from Aleppo. And this is a tomato from Homs. And uh, I mentioned the Syrian refugees that we worked with. This is a refugee farm in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon. And uh, a friend of mine is, a, is an aid worker there. And when she found out that we were growing all of these Syrian seeds, she brought uh, she took some uh, to give to the refugee farmers there. And she also took some other seeds of ours. They're actually, this woman is looking at um, the Syrian tomato on the left, but she's looking at a row of South Sudanese sorghum, which is, of course, not from Syria. But there is a tradition of sorghum growing in, in the Middle East as well. And uh, we knew that this one would do well there. And they were very happy to to be growing that too. We didn't have any indigenous sorghum varieties to offer. Um, and again, this is this is my dear friend Vivian Sansor from the Palestine Heirloom Seed Library. Um, she's holding in her hand there uh, the Jadu'ai watermelon, which is a really iconic Palestinian watermelon from Janin. And it is, um, there are all of these stories about people, um, about how this this watermelon fed people during times of of uh, of war. Uh, women hiding in the fields, giving birth in the watermelon fields, um, and uh, that watermelon. She really thought that it was gone, 
Uh, everybody she asked about it said, you're looking for a dinosaur. You're never going to find it. Um, but finally, she found someone who had a junk drawer in his workshop with a handful of seeds left. And they were able to regenerate more and more seeds from those. Um, but obviously now, in the context of what's happening um, in Palestine, it's more and more important than ever before to maintain these seeds and to um, to maintain this this uh, real proof of uh, of Palestinian identity and and uh, Palestinian life in uh, in in Palestine for thousands of years. Um, you know, it's hard to de it's hard to deny the humanity. It's hard to deny the reality of their history there when you understand the the food culture, the fact that these plants are, you know, there's there's documented evidence of these being grown by people there for forever, and just puts to the, puts um, makes makes it so apparent uh, that that you know what you hear from from so many propagandists out there that oh there is no such thing as Palestinian people. They're they're uh, they're just they're just Arabs who live there. They're, you know, uh, all of the things that I've heard from Zionists in, in my life. Um, yeah, the, the, the work of the seed library is so, so important. Uh, but we've been also working to get Palestinian seeds out of the U.S., uh, out of the government collection. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not always easy to find them. We're continually finding more because some of them are, well, a few, very few of them have the word Palestine in there. Plenty of them say they come from Israel, um, and then others don't say don't have either. They they say something else, um, and so you know you have to do some digging and learn how to maneuver the system. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, this is a Ukrainian tomato that we got out a couple of years ago, um, actually right before the war. But now it's more urgent that we grow them and distribute them. This is a pretty beefy pear-shaped tomato. Usually their pear-shaped ones are pretty small, but I really like this one. It's called uh, Bukovinsky. Um, so these are the Maldives Islands. Anybody ever, uh, anybody familiar with the Maldives? Um, mostly I've seen commercials for like vacations there because it's a beautiful tropical paradise. Uh, it's a series of coral atolls in the Indian Ocean. And uh, this one down at the bottom is, uh, I think this is called Lamu Atoll. And then the uh, one of the islands on the right side, right around the curve there, is this island called Conde Island. And um, I've never been there. I don't really know anything about what life is like there other than there are two parallel roads and one north-south road on this little island and about 300 people live there. Um, but that is where this uh, beautiful Tulsi basil was collected. Um, and it's a site, it's an island that has uh, old uh, Hindu and Buddhist ruins, really interesting place. Um, and uh, this is one of the most uh, fragrant, flavorful plants I've ever encountered um and it's just just beautiful um but the maldives are are um this is another one oh that's lamu the other was huvach atoll um so that lamu atoll has another island on it where this comes from any idea what that what that fruit is it's a melon it's a melon yeah that is a melon. It is a. It is botanically the same thing as a honeydew or a cantaloupe, um, but obviously it had a very different life. It had a very different background than those ones. Uh, it was probably. It, it seems to have been bred for the pulp around the seeds rather than for the flesh, uh, whereas you know you most other breeders might breed against pulp around the seeds. And or you know to have not as many seeds in general. Uh, it's sour. It's not sweet. I wish it were sweet. It looks like it should be sweet, but it's sour. And uh, I'm sure that you know I'm sure that that it had uh, important uses there. It may have been used as animal feed. 
Uh, it may have been used as a cucumber when it's small. You can use it just, you can treat it just like a cucumber. Um, maybe a base for making alcohol. Don't know. But, uh, you know, because the Maldives are so low lying, they're going to be one of the first entire countries to to disappear under the waves as as sea levels rise. Um, and so it's real. it's it's super important to preserve crops from a place like that. Um, and these are ones we've gotten out of the Grin collection. This is a tepary bean, um, like I was mentioning earlier. This is one that we are, we are not sure where this one comes from. It's one of the ones in there that doesn't have any um, any location identification. They just say uh, United States. So we don't know, no doubt this came from an indigenous community. We don't know which one, but it grew really well in New Jersey, surprisingly. Um, and even, even held up in the rain, didn't get moldy. Um, speaking of mold, uh, Moldova is the uh, is the poorest is the poorest country in Europe, um, bordering Ukraine and Romania. Um, this is where one of my ancestors came from. My grandmother was born just across the border uh, from Romania in uh, in Moldova. Um, it is uh, it's a post Soviet country, and um, people have been fleeing the countryside in Moldova in droves for the last couple generations to the point that, um, you know, most of the rural towns there are, uh, are mostly elderly people. Now, uh, young people have left for economic opportunity elsewhere. Um, but because of that, the amazing plants that have been stewarded there for generations are all at risk of extinction. And, um, the USDA has some, we've gotten this, uh, this is an interesting squash. You may have seen the naked seeded squash someplace. This is sort of an intermediate between naked seeded and not naked seeded. It has a very, very thin, flimsy skin. Um, but just a, a re another really interesting mutation that you wouldn't know about unless you really explore deeply the government collection. Um, this is the Moldovan green tomato, which is one of my favorite tomatoes on the planet. This is what it looks like when it's fully ripe. Not, this is not like a fried green tomato. This is a green when ripe slicing tomato. Um, and I mentioned earlier the, um, the calendula. Um, this is a calendula from Odessa, Ukraine, where my great grandparents fled from in 1905. Um, Odessa was for a time a, a, a really cosmopolitan, diverse place. It was about one third to one half Jewish. Um, my ancestors were Jewish and lived there. And um, they were the immigrant communities the early. It was the Greeks and the Jews were pitted against each other, fighting for the same uh, market in the uh, as uh, as peddlers. And um, and that was the beginning of violence in the, in the early 1800s. Eventually, Russian state violence against Jews became much more institutionalized um, to the point where it was it was uh, really unsafe to be Jewish in a place like Odessa. And, uh, um, you know, I know my ancestors left in 1905. And when I meet other people who have Jewish ancestry from Odessa, invariably, they also left in 1905. Um, you know, the stories exactly of what happened those were not told to the next generation. That was trauma that people wanted to leave in the past in general. Um, so I don't, I don't know all of those stories. Um, but when I found this growing there, uh, it, when I found that they had some Odessa varieties in the government database, I, I requested them and I'd been growing seeds from other people's cultures for, for so long. I didn't, it had never even occurred to me that seeds from places that I have an association with might be available there. Um, and then as I was growing this calendula two years ago, every time I was out in the field, I was thinking about my ancestors and thinking about, um, thinking about my family history and wondering, wondering, uh, and, and looking to dig a little bit deeper. So it actually sent me, sent me into my, into my email. And I, I had, I always, whenever I do uh, family history research, I always send an email to my family and like send the information that I got to them. So 
I started looking and I realized that a second cousin of mine a, a few years earlier had tried to connect me to a mutual third cousin that neither of us knew. And his, his name was Mark. And um, he had written this long letter in reply explaining some real cool details about our family history that we didn't know about. And um, I started years earlier, I had started writing a letter in reply to him. Like I had gotten to about three pages long telling him the history of my side of the family as I understood it, that I figured he probably didn't know, but I didn't finish it and I never sent it and I moved on and did something else. So this growing this calendula inspired me to go back, find that email. I spent a half an hour, finished it up, sent it off to him. And three hours later, he sent me another like five page email back. And he had been doing more research and his wife was a genealogist. She had hired someone to go to Belarus where that part of the family was from and to like translate things from the archives. And so suddenly I had, I had way more information than I had had previously. Um, he, he was able to tell me, I knew my great grandparents' names. He was able to tell me their parents' names and their grandparents' names. So I was able to suddenly go back to the early 1800s. Is, you know, it's something I never thought I would be able to do. Um, I also found my first verified farmer ancestor because of this, um, because one, because uh, Berko Klevenoff, my great, great grandfather, um, request, he requested, or he, he, um, he filed a loss in a fire with some authorities. He'd lost like 200, the equivalent of $250 worth of agricultural implements in a shed when it burned down. So that was my own, that's my only proof that I have some farmer ancestors, um, is a, is a burnt up shed from 1872. Um, but it, this calendula is, happens to be super beautiful as well. And it's also an obvious land race um, like, like the others. You can see that diversity um, and it's just uh, really beautiful. Um, one thing that's really cool about this one also, it has, um, you can see that plant in the middle there has really broad leaves and not a lot of flowers. And all the others have pretty narrow leaves and more flowers. Um, calendula is, has historically not just been uh, a medicinal plant, but it's a pot herb. It's been treated as a vegetable. And when I saw this pop up, I thought, oh, wow, this is like, this could be a remnant of some, you know, lettuce leaf variety of calendula. Um, so now over the next few years, I'm going to be trying to select for, you know, an Odessa lettuce leaf calendula that we can use as a vegetable in the future. Um, they had a nigella black seed nigella sativa from odessa as well this plant is also known as black cumin or just black seed you see black seed oil in the uh, health food store super super medicinal and i had no idea that 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 was even grown in odessa but it was, was collected in a market there in the 1980s and described as a local type and then also this melon from odessa uh, yellow melon. And um, yeah, the most, the, the, the heaviest part of this, um, of, of this uh, whole communication I had with this distant cousin was um, he was able to tell me information about, about my great grandmother's family and what happened to them, the, the, the ones who stayed in Europe. She was one of 10. And my mother growing up would always tell, would always recount this story of her grandmother trying to remember the names of her 10 siblings. She was an old woman at that point, and, she, and my mother would like to put on the Russian accent and say, there was, there was Golda and, uh, and Leia and Salman, and she would always forget the names, and they would change a little bit sometimes because she hadn't seen these people in, in, in almost 50 years. Um, she had gone to Buffalo, New York with one sister, so the two of them were two of 10, who still were in touch with each other, but the rest they pretty much lost touch with. And um, it turned out that six of them made it to the US. Uh, one of them went to Baku, Azerbaijan. That was Salman. And uh, he's responsible for his descendants. He actually died in the Gulag in the 70s. Um, but his descendants had these photographs. And uh, one 
um, of the three sisters who stayed in Europe, one of them, Golda, survived World War II. Um, but these two sisters, Leia and Perla, with their families, were murdered by the Nazis in uh, in 1943 in a, in a major massacre in Bober, the town in Belarus where they were from. So I had, you know, I had assumed that I had some relatives who who died in the Holocaust, but um, because of that plant, I was able to I was able to put a name and a face to my great grandmother's sisters. Like, you know, my mother grew up with this with this woman in her house. These were her these were her sisters. So suddenly, what had been a very abstract thing to me became um, much much more real. And only, you know, only highlights for me the importance of of doing this work and uh, of doing it with with as many cultures as I can can possibly. Um, this is some perennial wheat. So going from uh, looking looking into the past, now we're looking into the future. Um, perennial wheat, I think, is is going to be a much more important thing um, at in the future. Uh, already, people are working on perennials like Kernza, which is intermediate wheatgrass, which is about a fifth the size of the the grains of these perennial wheats. Um, but uh, the U.S. government system and all of these gene banks have collections of not just crops, but crop wild relatives as well. And the, those wild relatives are also under severe threat from climate change, from habitat destruction, from invasive species. Um, and uh, and those so those seeds that are in the system can be really valuable for breeding something like a Kernza. You can you know there's dozens of intermediate wheatgrass accessions in there, um, and then there's also you know thousands and thousands of wheat varieties. So anyone who's doing any kind of breeding project, this is a critical critical tool. Um, these are tartary buckwheats. They both look very different, but. Um, there's even more diversity in tartary buckwheat. That's a species that is uh, has more antioxidants. It's it's a uh, it grows in even um, in more uh, degraded land than traditional buckwheat does, and uh, I think it's really delicious. It makes really good pasta, makes good pancakes, um, and uh, I grew seventy eight different varieties one year, all from from the government collection side by side to see which ones would do okay in our area. And believe it or not, they, some of all of those grew. I planted eight seeds each and, uh, and I got at least one to grow of each one. Um, these are some mung beans from, uh, from Madagascar. You can see there's a little blue dappling on them. They're just beautiful. Um, this is another perennial. This is uh, tartar bread plant, it's called. Has anyone ever grown sea kale? Or seen sea kale. Sea kale is a perennial cabbage uh, family plant that has these big, shiny sea blue, uh, sea foam green blue leaves. This is a cousin of that sea kale that was that was domesticated for its root, and it has a very large root. People would dry it, powder it, and make flour with it. Like add it to half 50-50 with wheat. Um, Tartar bread plant or Cramby tataria, C R A M B E. That's from um, that's from cent sort of Western Central Asia, the Caucasus area up to the Baltics. It's uh, you can find it from seed companies in Estonia randomly. That's the only place that I know it's sort of being commercially sold. Maybe Hungary as well. Um, really cool plant though. Uh, the government has lots of asparagus seeds. You can breed breed your own asparagus and other perennials. Um, this is a tropical perennial called Cannavalia. It's a legume, uh, also called jack bean or sword bean, um, and it's it's grown. It's a it's a really important plant for agroecologists in the tropics because um, because it's perennial legume and it doesn't really take over like a lima bean would or something like that. You can use it as a perpetual source of nitrogen as a companion plant for other plants. I first uh, met this plant in Puerto Rico at the at an agroecology garden on the campus of the uh, the university that the students run there in uh, Rio Piedras. Um, really cool plant, and I grew those in New Jersey. You can 
you can grow it as an annual in New Jersey. Um, but we, we think it has some potential as a companion plant for uh, young trees, like because it has broad leaves and can help with weed suppression and it's putting nitrogen in the soil just for one season. Um, the government collection also has wild strawberries. This is a wild strawberry from a rest stop in Maine. Um, and it has it has been tested along with a bunch of other ones. This one was found to have powerful anti-cancer capabilities against a particular lung cancer type in uh, in vitro. Um, who knew? Um, these are some uh, white currants. The government has cuttings of those. I mentioned the Apios americana earlier, the ground nuts. Um, this is the ground nut flower, and they have those as well. Um, sea plantain is one of my favorite uh, future vegetables. We've started selling seeds for this. It's a wild plant. You might know it as goose tongue. And I, I, I know that there's a, there's a sort of a stubby leafed version that grows on the California coast um, that doesn't taste as good as these long, long leafed versions. Um, in Alaska, they call it goose tongue and they pickle it. But the government has some, has some seeds of this, this random wild plant that most people are not doing anything with. Uh, we already talked about the ultra cross okra and the collards earlier. This is our this is a planting of the ultra cross in uh, in Princeton. And in the middle of winter, the the row covers were old. The, those had not been protecting the plants at all the, during the winter. They were just on during the summer for um, for insects. But these plants like this, I took this picture in January last year and uh, these collards were still doing just fine. They had been completely frozen multiple times at that point and they just kept on going. That diversity is so powerful. Um, this is a packet of some fava beans from Damascus Bazaar. This is a, 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 a sunflower from Iran and, and a, a oilseed brassica from India. Um, so this is the website that if you want to explore, you should all write down. Um, and I wanted to see if somebody is looking for a particular plant, we can do a little, uh, we can do a little demo here. Um, Lauren, did you have something you were looking for? Oh, the nitrogen fixing corn. Um, yeah, I don't know if they have any here, but they let's see if they have any mucilaginous corn. So they, it all operates by Latin names. So you've got to know the Latin name when you're looking for something. So I'm calling this mucilaginous zia. And let's see if we get anything. Um, that one might be a lift. I would be surprised, but we'll see. There, yeah, it's that one's not a bit not super available. Let's see. No, oh, nothing. Okay. Nothing. All right, who's got another? Uh, who's got something they're looking for or curious about? Give, give me the name of a town, a county. Got it. Oh yeah, you're looking for chia. <laughs> Salvia columbaria. So that's one of the uh, Latin names for a species that they call chia. And government has 152 from Nevada, from Arizona, from California. Let's look at this one. See what we can learn about it. All right, collected in 2023. This is pretty new. You click this passport tab here. This is where you get more information about it. Um, so it was donated by the Bureau of Land Management based in Idaho. This is part of the Seeds of Success project. Site location is on a steepish sandy hill. Stay on stable ground and face the top of the hill when collecting. Be careful of pointy plants as well. 
Oh, that's funny. Um. <laughs> They have. So in these collections where they don't have a town, do they do they have? Is there some place? Um, they, do they give they, like lat lawn coordinates or? Oftentimes they keep these private. They won't tell you exactly where they came from. I've just clicked the seeds of success link, and it doesn't look like it's taking me anywhere. Um, but you can probably contact like if you go here. Um, it'll tell you who this donator is. Well, it should. Sometimes the site is a little slow, a little finicky, um, but normally this will get you to the address and maybe other contact info. You can contact them and try and get more information about it if it's if it's important for you to know. Um, Nate, you can also you can also find out if you know the collector's name. For example, if you put my name in Kanti Rawal. R A W A L. You will see how many how many accessions I've got into the system. How many do you think you have in there? I probably about fifteen hundred. Wow. <laughs> of, 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 of cowpeas, black eyed peas, legumes, oh, some of the okra from West Africa. Wow. Okay. How do you spell How do you spell that again? The last name is Rawal. R A W A L. Let's see. Let's see how many have your name here. So I sometimes, yeah, they won't. I just said return up to 500. So they'll probably, they'll probably, uh, we'll probably hit the maximum. Yeah. Right. Um, but also it looks like the website has slowed to a crawl, uh, which can happen. Uh, we'll take your word for it. <laughs> um, Right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to go back to the slideshow because the website is not cooperating. But. Um, yeah, so luckily I uh, I I did this in advance and took some bunch of screenshots so I can walk through uh, one other way to go through the system that's really helpful. So what we were doing was just searching for accessions, searching for information. If you click on this link here, descriptors, you're going to end up with you're going to end up at a different page. So then here you can you can click through this choose crop from a slider here. Um, you can look for maize, and uh, you know it'll tell you um, the oil percentage, the uh, ethnic group associated with it. In some cases, it will. You can click for ones that have de, uh, resistance to common rust uh, or to Goss's wilt or gray leaf spot, whatever's a problem. You know, you can look through and do a search for all the ones that are um, that are that are uh, resistant to that. Say you want the biggest seeded corn kernels that are that are in the system. You can click this thousand kernel weight button and then look for the one that has the highest grams, uh, whatever the heaviest thousand kernels, and that's the one you want. You can look for kernel color, endosperm color, ear length, ear number, all these other things. Um, days to silk, days to silk, uh, you know, 10 to 19, uh, all of this, all this really useful stuff. Um, but the insect resistance is also really important. Uh, especially if you're trying to breed. Um, so I went in once and uh, I was curious about soybeans for some reason. And uh, I saw this P34 and I was like, what the heck is P34? Um, it turns out that P34 is a, uh, is a protein that is the cause of most people's allergy to, um, to soybeans. And, um, there are, so when you click on P34 and then you click the next button, it has two options, P34 expressed or low or null for P34. And they have tested 14,381 
different soybeans in the collection for that protein. And when I clicked low or null for P34 and did a search uh, for equal to that value, I got nine. So nine out of 14,000 do not express this, this allergenic protein. Um, and they are all wild soybean ancestors, um, which is, uh, you can see the seeds are super tiny. So I clicked on one of these, um, collected in 1976 in Kumamoto, Japan. And uh, it was from a gravel roadside, the edge of a soybean field. Um, and uh, requested that. I was able to grow a few seeds in New Jersey of this, but theoretically from crossing this with, with domesticated soybeans, back crossing it with more domesticated soybeans again and again, you could end up with something that is a soybean, but is uh, hypoallergenic. So that's the kind of breeding project that you can do when you understand how to, how to navigate through this system. Um, that's just one example. Uh, but this, is, this shows you uh, all the information that they have on this one random soybean. You know, they have the pr percent protein percent of dry weight of the seed, 45%. Oil percent of dry weight of seed, 9.5%. How much of that oil is linoleic acid? How much of it is oleic acid, palmitic acid, et cetera? Um, just really, really useful stuff. Now, they don't have observations for every accession in there. Um, they don't have them for every species. Some species have not been examined at all. Um, but they have it for a lot. So, yeah, all I did was click this cart. They added it to my shopping cart here. And then all I had to do is check out and end up, then they'll mail them to you. Um, I know I'm running over time here. I'll just, I'll go blast through these. Um, this is a really cool squash from, uh, from the Bolivian Amazon, from an indigenous people called the Essay Asia people. Um, and they grow in sandbars in tributaries of the Amazon river. Um, but it's, you know, it's a beautiful squash. It's a cucurbit to maxima. And um, one year, the first year we were farming, actually, in 2014, we were growing the Nanticoke squash all over. And um, we were hand pollinating everything, waking up early in the morning to, to get out there when the plants are fertile. And um, we ended up growing, we ended up growing this one. And uh this one got lost in the weeds. I thought that they were all dead. I didn't think that we had had any survive. And then when the fall arrived, I found one fruit sitting there in the patch where I was growing them. And I was, and we had not gotten around to hand pollinating that one. Obviously we didn't even know it was there. So I put the seeds in a bag. I labeled them as open pollinated, uh, yamey squash. That's the local name for it. Um, and when I pl finally planted them four or five years later, just to see what happened, um, all of them looked like this. And uh, so I realized what we had was a, clearly an F1 hybrid. Um, and because it resembled so much so many of the Nanticoke squash, which I know we'd been growing that year, it was obvious to me that this is an accidental cross between this Yamey squash and the Nanticoke. So in the first generation, when you have an F1 they're all uniform when you have two when you have two relatively uniform populations crossed together you end up with something quite uniform so they all looked like this i thought we could call this the pink panther squash if we were able to stabilize it um but also the the fun thing about breeding something like squash is the f2 generation and so the next year i grew them again and we got we got this diversity popped out um, but it's really, you know, there's, this is, it's a fun project, but it also has, has real potential for helping us breed, um, to breed heat tolerant, uh, vine borer resistant squash for the Southeast. Most of my friends in the Southeast will not even grow Maxima squash because the squash vine borer destroys them. Um, but the Nanticoke squash is from the East coast. It is adapted to the squash vine borer. So that borer can bore all the way up to the fruit and 
not kill the plant. It will re re root at various nodes. Like it can have a completely rotten stalk, and then it will have made a new root at a node, you know, a couple nodes before the fruit, and the fruit will still develop. So that that kind of resistance is really important. And if we, you know, we've accidentally crossed it into this tropical squash from Bolivia, and now this is an ongoing breeding project. We've offered these seeds for sale uh, in the catalog. I think we still have them in the catalog as just Yami X Nanticoke, um, so that other people can take up this project and and see if they can breed anything useful or interesting from it. Um, one of the last ones I have here, this just blew my mind when I found this in the government system. This is Jojoba. And when you click on the species name in a listing, it takes you to a page that looks like this, where you have the Latin name, nomenclature, history, common names, distribution, and economic uses. So the common names are goat nut or jojoba. And then this is the distribution. It's native to the Southwest, to the Sonora Desert, um, Baja California, Arizona, and California. It's been cultivated now around the world in, in dry land areas. Uh, I think the most it's most widely cultivated now in Australia and in Israel. Um, but uh, this is the part that blew my mind. Economic uses, potential as petroleum substitute. Um, and in the 1970s, this was something that people were got pretty excited about. There were oil lines and everything. Um, it was it it actually became Hohoba became. Uh, really popular initially as a substitute for sperm whale head oil, which used to be a really important industrial product. Um, and and uh, you know the 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 companies that dealt in sperm whale head oil were not too happy, but sperm whale hunting had been uh, whaling had been banned. So they needed an alternative and Hohoba fit the bill. Uh, but when big oil found out there were people, interested in researching it and working on it as an alternative to oil, to petroleum, um, suddenly the funding for that dr dried up. The government stopped doing anything. Uh, but there are the USDA still has some large plantings of jojoba down in Arizona, just sitting and in Parlier, California, just sitting there. And uh, if you ask them for cuttings, they'll send you cuttings. And even if you're in New Jersey, <laughs> where you can't grow jojoba, <laughs> they will send you cuttings and you can root them and, uh, and, and try to grow your own jojoba. Um, you know, it, it's a, I'm not saying that we should plant the deserts in jojoba to replace petroleum, but the fact is we could. Uh, and we could have been doing that. We could have been doing that for a long time. Um, some crop wild relatives again, just just to demonstrate some of the some of the diversity that's out there. Like you know these wheat relative uh, wheat wild grasses, wild grasses that are ancestors or related to corn. This is the you know this is the uh, bean um, wild relative, sunflower wild relatives. There's salinity tolerance could be gotten from the pico sunflower. Um, this is some uh, eastern filbert blight resistance could come from the eastern hazelnuts. Western corn rootworm resistance could come from uh, gam eastern gamma grass, et cetera. Um, and this is a really important map. It shows global hotspots of distributions of crop wild relatives, uh, species that are assessed as being in urgent need of further collecting because they are going uh, extinct in the wild and they are not in gene banks. And it's not just in places, you know, like Indonesia and Southern China, the Iberian Peninsula, Turkey, these are really critical places, but North America is loaded with, with uh, species as well. Um, those yellow colors mean, you know, quite a bit of density of species in need of collecting. Um, this is a beet wild relative that's a perennial leafy beet. Um, Galapagos tomato is another one, um, one of the ancestors of the watermelon, Citrullus amaris from Namibia, this one as well, Colosynthus. Um, all of these uh, are, are interesting wild relatives. And going back to the calendula, uh, and I think this is the last one I have here, 
this is uh, the last plant anyway. This is um, this is called Calendula maritima, and it is a it is a critically endangered Calendula cousin uh, from the far western tip of Sicily, and all of the other um, all of the other places where it once lived, it's extinct. And the place where it still lives now has been heavily developed for sea salt. You ever buy Italian sea salt? There's a good chance it comes from these big flats that have been industrial flats where they're evaporating salt. Um, and this beautiful, um, super fragrant, uh, almost tacky when you touch it. It's sticky. It's got that much resin on it. It definitely has medicinal uses, but it's been so understudied. It can't be studied in Europe because it's critically endangered. And yet the USDA has seeds in the collection, and we were able to grow this in South Jersey last year. And um, and and we got a, quite a few calendula wild relatives um, that we're going to be playing with over the next couple of years. Um, so this is what we mean when we talk about liberating seeds from seed banks. And um, happy to answer some questions. <laughs>